Thank you. Uh, can you can you hear me? Is there anything in the sound that should I hang another microphone? Okay. Oh, now you can hear me. Okay, cool. Well, welcome and thanks for being here. Uh, thank you, Fetia, for the introduction. They're awake. They're awake. They're awake. By the way. Um, yeah, something happened in June 2015. Someone that for a few years was something that was expected for a few years, but not actually everybody expected for a few years. Um, in June, someone said this in a very specific moment. Any idea? Do you remember it? So, yeah, someone, a really, really nice guy, not, uh, his name is Donald Trump. And when he was doing one of the most important things in his life, uh, except inheriting a large amount of money previously, um, he said something interesting. He said, oh, now the government has a five billion website in terms of the expenditure for the website, and I can get website for three dollars. And how many of you think that this is vastly what our clients most of the time think about our job? So uh, Mr. Trump is uh, involved in real estate. And I'm going to start with a story that is not 100% about real estate, but it's still about houses. Um, in 1980, when I was born, my father built the house where my family was supposed to live. And uh, it was in the countryside, so he took down the old stables and built a new, a new house. And so I've seen my father throughout my entire youth being able to do any sort of job that was required to keep the house going, like to, to actually make it. It required a few years. If you ever built uh, a house, you know that if it's for you, if it's for yourself, it's going to take probably 10 years to go from uh, the beginning to the end. Um, and then, uh, after many years, we moved, and uh, I had to take a challenge that was kind of similar. So I almost did the same. When I was 22, um, I was a, a developer, and from one day to the other, we decided to move house. And the new house required a vast uh, renovation. So uh, I put a, a sort of my uh, developer's life on hold for a while, and I spent like six months on the construction side, uh, dealing with companies that were coming in and coming out. So plumbers, electricians, and tilers, and builders, uh, working around the clock to make this house um, become um, uh, usable for us. And as you can imagine, I was pretty much useless because I was coming from a complete different experience. Uh, I, I had this sort of attitude that is like, you know what, I, I deal with computers, I like to touch clean stuff, and now I'm completely covered in dust. <laughs> Not sure this is the place for me. But anyways, uh, it was my house, so I was trying to, to make it work. And I remember that once, um, I was actually the only, th I was doing the only thing that I was able to. Uh, taking debris from one side of the place and take it to the other, so someone else could uh, get rid of them. And, um, and there was this guy, this, one of these uh, workers, that came to me and was asking me if I, was, um, if I could help him fixing a pipe. So I realized that I couldn't. Actually, it was kind of easy to realize. And so I called the plumber to help him. And then after uh, a few minutes, he was also asking me if I could help with, uh, with a socket, an electric socket that was uh, hanging from the wall. And so we had to, ca to call the electrician to do that. And then when it was time to fix the tiles, again, I was completely useless, and I had to call the tiler to fix that. To the point that this worker at some point was asking me, so what exactly are you doing here? <laughs> and he didn't know I was the owner, though, and I was actually paying him. Um, but the situation was kind of interesting, because uh, being there was not just enough. I, I could help people to fix problems and move people around, but I was not actually doing anything very useful. Nevertheless, in those six months, I probably got uh, the, the best um, uh, business lessons in my life, uh, things that I'm still using today. Uh, I learned uh, what it means to show up early and leave very late. And um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about that. So my name is Luca Sartoni. You can find me on Twitter, on 
any network that requires you to sign up, I am probably signed up with that uh, username. And I work at WordPress.com where I help uh, growth. So let's start with three things about plumbers. What, how, what, what do they have that we don't? Because we have a lot of stuff that they don't. Have you ever searched for a plumber on Google? They have super cool websites. They have a lot of social media um, accounts. They have Instagram accounts with spotless pictures of everything they do, right? Absolutely not. They're not on LinkedIn. They're not anywhere. And their website, they really suck. And we spend our entire business life telling each other that if you are not spotless on uh, LinkedIn, you don't have endorsement, you're not going to get clients. So how does it happen that they are completely not there and they strive pretty much uh, since ever? And we struggle a little bit to find new clients, to negotiate with them, and to make sure that we can make a living out of our digital uh, industry. So the first thing that uh, we can immediately identify in a plumber is something that we should uh, learn very well. Status. So you can be a plumber or you can be a not plumber. There's, no, there's nothing in between. It's kind of binary. You can, uh, you can do that job or not. There's not like a sort of a plumber. There's not I'm a plumber slash painter. You are or you're not. And the same we should uh, start to think about when we try to define what exactly we are. Uh, wh what else is connected with the status of a plumber? It's not just about the plumber that says, I am or I'm not. It's also, we identify the plumber. If I say plumber, we all know what a plumber is. But most of all, if we take one person, we can identify him as being a plumber or not in a very easy way. We just say, well, fix that. If it's able to, probably is. If it's not, it's not. Um, then another things that plumber have are tools. What is the primary tool of a plumber? Have you ever seen a plumber? A wrench, right? And what is the primary tool of us? Developers, designers, what is our primary tool? This? Well, for many people, though, is this. Having a computer in front of them is their primary tool, or their phone, or their website. However, that doesn't fly. And i show you why it doesn't fly. If you see somebody doing this, is it working? Is it on Facebook? Is it writing a story? Is it checking his email? Is it booking a flight? You don't know. But when you see a plumber with a wrench and he's working on pipes, he's working. And when he's not working, he's probably not doing that. So, <laughs> right? Then, what else? Um, if you go to a Home Depot and you're looking for power tools, let's say a drill, you can find a vast array of drills going from 100 bucks to a few thousand. What happens um, when the plumber goes to the Home Depot or to actually the provider for tools? Is he buying the $100 <coughs> drill or is he trying to buy the biggest, big ass drill that he can afford? <coughs> Probably is going to go up because if the plumber is a professional, wants to have a reliable tool. What are our tools? We just said that probably the computer is not the best thing we can think about when we think about tools, but someone said, my mind, or our, our brain, or our knowledge. How much do we invest in our knowledge, and how? Because in my experience, uh, I tend to spend a lot of time reading free stuff from random sites that I randomly run into, or because my friends on Twitter share. But how about investing more time on premium content that requires much more uh, um, effort to understand, like traditional education, a little more formal education. Uh, there are platforms online that they require a lot of work to get you something, uh, to learn something. And I think about Coursera or anything that requires a deep education and not just the first surface 
of education that we can find just reading random stuff online. That must be considered one of our most important power tools. And then there is something extremely important that plumbers are very good at. They deliver value. Otherwise, we would not call them. They know exactly how urgent is something, how needed is something, and how bad you want that. So if your pipes are leaking, they're going to fix that. Because they know that you identify the value not in how much they ask, but in what they deliver. And this is very, very important. We're going to see that a little better later. Then there are other three things very important coming from Plumber. Um, they know perfectly who needs who. Do they show up, ring at the door, and say, hey, I know that you have pipes. And you know, like in 10 years, they're going to probably have a problem. How about having a subscription with me so we can make sure we keep them up? No. The pipe is going to leak, and you are going to call them. And then they're busy, or they have clients, or maybe next week. OK, I'm coming today, but there is a premium rate. You know, They perfectly know who holds the knife and from what side. Then they know that you'll probably call them in a very urgent state of mind, which is, this plate is flooding. Uh, please show up as soon as possible. And the guy's like, uh, yeah, next week. <laughs> so keep this in mind when they negotiate. Um, and again, the value they deliver is well understood. Let's take a few examples of what happens in our industry. And let's see what would the plumber do. Um, how about for this project there is no budget? How would the plumber react to that? He wouldn't even laugh. He would be like, OK, dude, I'm cool. And he leaves. Do you do the same? Or do you believe that working for free a little bit then will give you a lot of visibility for next time? Or if you do this, there will be a lot of more work in the future. Think about this. You call the plumber and say, dude, if you fix that, there will be a lot of more work in the future. <laughs> or something else, like, ah, come on, it's just a five-minute job. When the guy is, is down there, right, fixing, and we're like, oh, come on, just do it. Um, and the next one is my favorite. Um, my 13-year-old nephew is good with computers, too. <laughs> So when your heater is not working, try calling your nephew. He's going to do it. He's very good with the wrench. Um, let's see what, what we can learn from them. How can we apply that to us? Because of course, we cannot just take it and, and bring it in. It's not about going to clients only when their website is blown up and, and, and we pretend they are in panic. They probably are like, oh, come on again. But they're not feeling the water piping in, right? So let's start with a few principles that we can take from them and probably adapt a, li adapt a little bit to us. The first one is this. This is a cornerstone of my business since then. One, once, the plumber himself, and that's why the presentation got the title, said this to me. If it's paid, it's a job. Otherwise, it's a hobby. If if 99% of the startups I mentored in my life knew about this, they probably have worked a little better on their business model. When you think about your own business model, always think about this. I'm not saying that having a hobby is bad. I'm just saying call it with the right name. And it's pretty funny that I say this at this kind of event where there are, how many, 25 volunteers? The organizers are volunteers. The speakers are volunteers. You are giving away your Saturday to be here, probably your Sunday tomorrow to volunteer. Is that a hobby to us? It's not? What is that? It's a call? It's, what is it? Is it a job or is it a hobby? It's neither. So what it is? How do we call it? Passion. And that's a very good word. 
Unfortunately, like many other words that we have in this industry, we use them so bad and for everything that they lose their true value. It's like when we say awesome. Everything is awesome, right? But passion is very interesting and usually comes up here. Passion is one of those words where we are very happy to use it. Unfortunately, it's worthless because it's not about your passion. It's about the contribution that you can give. And this works across everything, across the hobby and across the job too. Your client doesn't care about your passion. Your client cares about the contribution that you can give to him or to her. So make sure that when you think about passion, passion is extremely valuable, but don't overuse it. So for instance, if you have your website, don't spend three paragraphs to tell about your passion. Spend three paragraphs to tell about the contribution that you could give to others. And when you contribute to a project like WordPress, of course the passion needs to be there, but it's also about how much you contribute. And when, and how, and how you relate to others. So if this is absolutely true for the traditional industry, you will very unlikely have a plumber that is going to do it for free because he has a true passion. For us, we need to consider this and maybe reinterpret in our industry or in our uh, way of doing business because this community is very different from any other community in the industry. So when we think about the tech industry, there are many other um, open source and, and free software projects that they have a community. But what I've seen here, it's very unlikely to happen in other communities. Uh, so much diversity, so much inclusion, this is something that cannot, of course, be polarized with this, but keeping this in mind is not bad when you are running a business, when you're trying to pick a new client, when you're trying to, to, uh, make, uh, to make decisions about your next project. And make sure that you call things with a real name. And there's nothing bad in having an expensive hobby. I learned that myself when I was trying to become a photographer. Like, I like photography. I do photography since I was born, probably. My father gave me a camera, I was five. And then I tried to make it a business was not for me. Photography for me will be always be a very expensive hobby, but will never be a profession. Second take is invest in your tools and make sure you identify them. If you think that knowledge is your tool, invest in that. It doesn't mean that you have to uh, pay for uh, something with money. Investment does not require money. Investment requires effort. Then that effort can be time, can be contacts, can be dedication, can be contribution, like all the guys here with the red shirt. That is effort, and that is an investment. If you, if you think how many people you have opportunity to get to know here today, the simple fact that you are dedicating your Saturday to meeting other people and helping the community, that is an investment in your tool, because the network is also one of your key tools. You can, if you want to go very fast, you can go alone. But if you want to go very far, you need other people with you. And network is the best way to make sure that other people are going to come with you and you are going to follow the right flock. And then, something that is extremely, extremely important to clarify. As I said, call things with the right name. Value, quality, and price. Sometimes they get crumbed together and they come up as a unique thing. But they're not. They're very separate. <coughs> what is value? Value is what we deliver. Value is what the other person on the other end of the negotiation gets out of it. Is what we can contribute. Quality is how good we do things. And price is how much reward we want for the first two. Remember that most probably you don't have control on all of them. Not for sure you don't have it when you are negotiating with your plumber because quality by, for the plumber, what is quality for the plumber? The regulation he has to stick to. Because if he can do something less than the law requires, so the plumbing work is a little bit regulated, more than I expected. But if the plumber can do a little less, he would do it. That's why we have laws that they tell them that things should be done properly. What is value for them? 
is the fact that when they came in, the pipe was leaking, and when they went out, the pipe was not leaking anymore. So it's something that we perceive. And price is the amount of money they ask, and no matter what, you're going to pay. Otherwise, the quality is ensured by the law, but the value is not. And they can actually don't take the job. Same happens when we do the other way. When we get a new client, when we get a new project, are we sure we are delivering enough quality? Our job is, our industry is not as regulated. We don't have quality standards that they are required by the law, except a few countries like and for specific projects in, in the tech industry. But in general, when we make a website or when we do a design, quality is very subjective. Are we sure that the level of quality that we deliver is understood by our client? Maybe we should dedicate more time in making sure that that happens, in explaining why the quality needs to be there, in explaining why we are dedicating so much time in the wireframes, why so much time then in the mockups, why there is a process to follow, why something cannot take five minutes even if it takes five minutes, why those five minutes require 10 years of experience before. Then value. Are we sure we are communicating to the client what they get out of it? Or they just think they're going to get a $3 website like Donald Trump thinks he gets. I'm pretty <coughs> sure he pays th those $3. I'm also sure he gets a $1.5 site back though. <coughs> Because if you go there with that attitude, most probably on the other end, there is somebody that knows that better than you. So are we sure that we deliver value to our client, or we're just trying to deliver stuff that they don't need? And price. Don't be ashamed of asking for money when you deliver value and quality. Don't. And don't uh, think that being paid for doing things is bad by itself. The only reason I think, I think for being concerned about our price is if we're not solid with value and quality. As soon as we know that our quality is high and we can communicate it properly, as soon as we know that the value is there, then money is not a problem. Just to close the plumber bracket, <coughs> you know, life is a game and it's all about how you play it. So, when I hear people that they say that this industry is harsh, um, I tell them they should go for six months uh, shoveling debris in a construction site, or you know, try manual labor for a couple of weeks, and then you come back and you tell me about this industry. And when they tell me that this community is difficult, uh, they don't know what they're talking about, for sure. Yeah, of course. The last plumber I hired in Vienna, his name was, was Mario. <laughs> and this is this, this, unbelievable. It, it sounds like I make it up, but it's absolutely true. I had, I had uh, a tab was stuck. I called the, the plumber. The plumber shows up. I don't speak German and I live in Vienna. So I try to, uh, when I have to deal with, uh, with people that they, that they are like very local, there's always a little bit of misunderstanding. But the guy shows up, speaks perfect English, fixes the tab and asked me for 20 euros. And I thought it was like a joke. Like, I didn't expect to get a 20 euro charge for, for that. I expected way more. And, and I said, oh, thanks. And, he, and he's like, well, I give you my card. So next time, if there's anything, just call me. And he gives me the card. And the card says Mario as a first name. And I'm like, dude, you are Super Mario. <laughs> he didn't get it like, at all. So and I was, I was like super excited. I was like, oh, you're Super Mario. And he was like, no, it's just Mario. <laughs> And I was like, you know the plumber? It was like, no. That was super odd. Well, thank you very much. And uh, <laughs> of course, there is time for questions. Not a lot of time, but quite some time. Uh, we have a lot of time. Sure. Uh, there's one over there. There's one over here. Okay, so let's go uh, uh, further on your uh, analogy with plumbers. Uh, I used to be in construction. Uh, Round of applause for the construction guy. <laughs> uh, uh, 
when it comes to like the bigger production job, not just fixing the fixing the leaking uh, uh, pipes, but the bigger construction job, uh, the money has been made on the pipes, on the materials. Um, there are no open source pipes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's very logical that you pay a, a price for the materials and the price for the hours is usually the price which is uh, um, well milked. It's, it's, it's been narrowed down. If you just just a plumber who does the, the hourly work, you get the, the low rate. The money has been made in the in, well, in the value you bring with materials. So I think it's very important to uh, add that to the equation you bring. Yeah. Uh, if you if you're looking for a plumber, uh, and if you don't know one, you look if he's like in the in a plumber directory, if he's uh, associated with the, the plumbers union or whatever. And those are parts where you can, I, I look at it, where, where you can uh, differentiate, like uh, the developer that just built the simple website, or the developer that's been recommended because he's got the background and the uh, references that you need. Yeah. Uh, shall I repeat it? Yeah, okay. Sure. Uh, what is the question? <laughs> well, uh, it's, it's more of a remark. Like, okay. it, it's, it's not a it's not a straightforward analogy. You, you, you just can't say be the plumber. Okay, like, I, I, there's more to it than just, got it. just being the plumber. Okay, I will explore a little bit that part. Yeah. So uh, he says something extremely true. The analogy doesn't fit 100% because there is a, a type of plumber that I didn't explain how they work. So there is the plumber that is in my presentation that you just call, it shows up, it's one-to-one -one relationship, very similar to the one that probably most of us have with their clients. And then there are uh, bigger companies that they do plumbing or they do any, anything in the construction business uh, that they take bigger things. Like imagine the people that are building the train station right now, they're not single people that they get together. They are, there's a large organization behind. Or when they build a hotel. A hotel is like a gold mine for plumbers because there are like 200 rooms with 200 bathrooms and so on. Um, and of course, those companies, they work a little different. They work a little uh, similar to larger companies that we know in our industry. And he remarked something on something extremely true. There are plumbers that they only get the hour rate or let's see, the, the manual work they provide is what they charge for. But there are also plumbers that they also bring in pipes and, and other um, um, materials, and those materials, they have a price, and they also make money on top of that price. So, but it's very similar to what happens if you are uh, reselling Microsoft SharePoint, or if you use a, an open source and free software stack like we do at WordPress, right? Um, of course, those two business models are different. And uh, on one end, um, the analogy probably works. Um, with with uh, materials, I'm not sure it works either, even if we compare them to uh, reselling Microsoft. Because uh, on one end, the problem is not that those materials, they have a cost. The problem is that those materials are physical objects. And Microsoft is not selling physical objects except hardware. So on software, when you start to dematerialize, you have interesting stuff. Like you develop once and you distribute millions of times. Uh, with pipes, you have to build every single, single one of them. But making a cut on top of commercial products is also another viable, um, another, another viable business model also for consultants. And I see that happening. Like you resell a premium plugin or you resell themes or... Uh, um, yeah, or software. Basically, you, you buy commercial software and you resell or you become a distributor for someone that charges on subscription. Uh, that is also interesting to, to explore, uh, a little far from, uh, from the topic, but it's interesting to see how analogies in the traditional world can be applied into our world. But always remember, the keys are more about uh, thinking about what is the value that we provide, what is the quality that we ensure, and what is the price that we request. Because I know that we all struggle to provide the best quality. I also know that sometimes we don't provide enough value because we're not tackling the value problem of our client from the right angle. Most of the time, they don't need a website. 
or they need something else. And I'm not sure that we, always, uh, we are always giving them the right solution. On the other hand, as, as, as far as goes my experience, we totally suck at asking money. How many of you think they're good at asking money? And how many of you feel that they don't ask enough money or they are not very good at asking money? <laughs> so um, if you go to, uh, to uh, a, plumbing, a plumber's convention <laughs> and you ask how many of you uh, are unable to ask for money, they, they are looking at you like, what are you talking about? I have people that they ask money for me. Uh, we have a structure for asking money. Like the plumber, if it works alone, probably is going to tell the hourly rate. Otherwise, he has a secretary or someone that is taking the accounts. And he's not going to call you in person unless it gets really late in the payment and then he calls you in person. But in general, you deal with someone else. So they, they build this structure. Uh, they have these structures. We, don't, we tend not to have it unless we work for an agency or something. But one to one, we tend to suck a little bit in asking for money. Uh, was that cool? Your question. Okay, so Luca, you spend like numerous uh, hours speaking in word camps, and you invest so many, so much time in like helping the Italian WordPress community. Is this your job, a hobby, or an investment? Uh, for me, it's an investment. Hundred uh, percent. So I repeat the question. She said that I spend uh, a lot of time in contributing to work camps, organizing work camps, uh, helping the Italian community, and other uh, uh, other activities like this around WordPress. Uh, and she was asking, is it for you a hobby, a job, or an investment? Um, I have no fear to say that for me it is one of the biggest investment I'm doing in my life. For me, it's hundred percent investment. It's an investment on the fact that no matter what happens in my professional life. I know enough people and I helped enough people to be reasonably safe regarding my future in the industry. That's plain and simple. It's not, um, it's not a ransom that I'm playing against the community, like I help you so much, but I learned it on myself. Uh, I started contributing to free software that I was 17. I, w I started contributing to Linux, and, uh, but I really suck at coding, like I I'm really bad. So I realized that if I wanted to help, there was no chance I could do that, like coding, because otherwise they would need someone else fixing the shit that I was doing. Uh, so I started dealing with humans a little more, and I realized that the tech community really needs people that they deal with humans more than people that they deal with computers. Um, and, and I found myself to be better at that. So I started doing that, and, and the more time and the more effort I was putting into helping others, the more things were coming back. Um, so this is pretty much why I do it. Uh, I'm not saying that you should do it for the same reason, but it's a good take. Um, if you have other reasons to do it, keep on doing it. And if you feel you don't have enough reason to do, to do that, come and talk to me. I will convince you. Uh, yeah. Other questions? Oh, two. Uh, we do this, and then we go there. You start. And so the word value was probably repeated most in your talk. And uh, one, uh, from my point of view, like one big challenge in context of our industry with values that I see is immediacy. So there is a, this, uh, the leaking pipe is a great metaphor for value in general, but in plumbing, you know, it speaks today. Yeah. So it was leaking in the morning, it's not leaking in the evening. But uh, in our industry, in code, things often move at a very different pace. How to frame value when you do something and uh, the, like, the state of it is that it will be good like over next weeks or months or literally years? That's, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. So uh, I just repeat it. Um, and when I, when I went with the analogy of the leaking pipe, um, I was clearly showing how the plumber fixes something that everybody understands it's urgent. So there is a problem that needs to be solved immediately. And in that immediacy, the value is immediately perceived. However, in our industry, most of the things that we do and most of the value that we provide has a very longer term. So it's something that we do today to provide value in the long run 
Sometimes not even in a single shot. It's not something that we do today and in two weeks is going to provide value, but it's something that builds up value compounded over time and humans are really bad at evaluating that. Was it? Okay. That is absolutely true. It actually works also for uh, everything else in our life. If we think about cigarettes, um, if smoking cigarettes would mean that at some point in our life we would die immediately, like shocked, dead on the floor, probably nobody would smoke. <laughs> Uh, but because that damage is compounded very, very slowly over time, our brain cannot process the, in a rational way, so it's like, whatever, and we keep on smoking. That is how it works. In our industry, it's very difficult to tell people, well, if we don't have a change of paradigm in, a, in the structure now, probably in six months, we start to have problems. In two years, we start losing, well, we will have uh, money loss, because people think, yeah, but I need this today. True. That's why we need to work on communicating better quality and value. Because of my background uh, and a little bit of involvement in marketing, I see most of the time that this kind of problem should be solved through communication. So we should learn how to tell people that something is wrong or that something is good. So it's more about being able to explain why something is needed to be done in that specific way and make sure that that gets understood. It might take a week, it might take a month. This community is investing a lot in that. Think about WordPress TV, think about all the educational program that we have. Those are not meant for us, We're not meant to just go and watch ourselves on stage. Those are meant to make sure that what we say and the, and the value that we bring is understood more and more outside of the community and new people come in and get educated. So the more we're able to educate our clients, the better they will understand how much value and how much quality you bring, and so there will be a little less discussion on price. <coughs> so, this one there. Uh, yeah. Uh, this thing, I would think uh, the work is rather straightforward. With this making websites or software, it's often uh, you run into new things that are unknown, and it's easy to get into <coughs> about it and to ask the price for it that you, well, later on think that you should ask. Like my first web shop that I built, it's payment gate based. I never done that, and well, I was, a, you know, and you know, I didn't ask a full, uh, very high price. Uh, and then after the project, I think like, oh, I really asked too little for it, but. Um, yeah. First of all, I want to say that I feel you, brother. We all did the same. <laughs> so he says, uh, he says that in, in, the, in the plumbing industry, everything is very straightforward. So also the pricing is kind of easy to, uh, to estimate. Now our industry is very difficult to estimate prices because most of the time we're tackling new problems that we never solved before. So we don't, uh, so we don't know exactly how much money we should ask up front. That is a pure matter of negotiation, but there is one thing before answering that. Uh, when you say that the traditional industry has straightforward problems, on that I'm not sure I agree. Uh, again, try a couple of weeks with them and you will figure out that it's not exactly that way. Um, however, it's true that it's very difficult for us to, do, to make estimates. And that's why uh, we shouldn't make wild estimates. We should have better processes for onboarding our clients. We should have better processes for charging them. The, but on this, there is an entire universe. There are, uni there are like entire books about lean negotiation, about uh, uh, changing the relationship in the, con uh, the contractual relationship with the, w between us and our clients. There are uh, formal negotiation or, the, or agreements that they are not based on a wide estimation at the beginning and then consequences of that negotiation along the way, but iteration on the relationship with the client so the price can be, is not estimated. It's just built up over time when the value comes in and comes out. But that is a matter, is a, to me, is a pure matter of negotiation and contractualization of the relationship. More than just, but we all went through that. I did jobs five, ten years ago that if I had to do it now, first of all, I would not do them. And then I know I would charge differently. And probably the client would not give it to me. Uh, and that's why they were giving it to a 21 years old, very inexperienced guy who was asking for like peanuts, right? So yeah, we need to get better at that. 
Um, how many of you have a, have a lawyer that, how many of you consult a lawyer for their contracts for their, with their clients? Not many. Uh, start thinking about that. That was a big discovery I had a few years ago. I thought that a lawyer was an extra cost, was very, you know, overheading my, my economy in terms of my personal professional economy. Uh, but it's exactly what they think about us. Like, why do I need somebody to do a website when I can have it for three euros by, you know, a random agency in Asia or something? Or I can go to any of those free platforms and, and just do it uh, myself. Or my cousin can do that. Uh, but actually, the lawyer will help you. Because the lawyer, if he's a good one, he will show you how a job cannot fly in that manner. Like, he will be like, dude, at the end of the day, you're charging $3 per hour. It's not... You know? and, and he sees that. If he's a good lawyer, he will tell you. And he will also say, look, uh, what happens if he's not paying the right time? Can we add this clause so you get covered? They usually uh, kind of uh, change the way you approach the contract, and usually it's for the best. And nowadays, there are like very interesting services also online that they do that. So keep that in mind. It can be useful. You will never get, in, uh, you will never get a, a plumber today that is not legally covered on what he's doing. One well, last short question. Yeah, then we have another one. Well, if, if there's not enough time for everybody for questions, I will be around today and tomorrow. Uh, stop me anytime and, and we can talk about it. Still one, one question. When you want to be a plumber, uh, you need education, you need a certification. Yeah. If you want to Google partner, then you need certification. Yeah. Uh, how it's about WordPress? How can you guarantee it? I can't, uh, but um, that is extremely true. If you want to become a plumber, um, you cannot just buy a wrench and, and go down the street. You need certifications, you need a business license, you probably need to be part of a trade according to the local laws. There are many entrance barriers to that industry. Uh, the entrance barriers to our industry is probably uh, access to a computer, and that's why we should not consider it our primary tool. It's too easy to get there. Uh, but there are ways to qualify your work. Um, the network is extremely important. There's a big difference if you are well located in the network and well recognized or not. So if you, inst we don't want to, to build entrance barriers in this industry. I am totally against it. I, I hope that all of you are against it. The fact that we work for inclusion is the foundation of the fact that we don't like the idea of having certified uh, access to the industry. Probably we want to have qualified access to the industry. We want to make sure that people that they do really, really bad job get disqualified and we don't have to deal with them. And that's why we have to work on our quality, on our network, and on our knowledge. Because in our industry, reputation is the most valuable investment in terms of uh, that sort of qualification that plumbers do through a <coughs> certificate. Um, it's also true that if the plumber doesn't do the job properly and then uh, the heater blows up, uh, the plumber is legally responsible. If the website blows up, was a hacker, you know, it was not me, I told you, or like, uh, you know. So there, there are little, you know, it's very unlikely that we kill people with a bad website. That's too easy. Uh, that's too easy. But it's also the good part of it. It needs to be easy. It needs to be easy to get in and, hard, and, and you know, hard to get to the top. There's a game called Othello, I think. On the on the, it's, a, it's a board game. On the, on the, on the box, it says, um, a few seconds to, to learn how to play, a lifetime to master it. And I think this should be what our, in the, our community should be. Like a few seconds to get in and an entire life to master it. Well, thank you very much, and you will find me around if you come <laughs> here.